var? Bizim bizim neredeyse ben Mart'ın başından beri biz kar, kampüs kapalı. Lablar kapalı. Ha, lab'a giremiyorsunuz. O çok önemli. Evet. Yok. Kamp- kampüse giremiyoruz. Undergradlerin girişi yasak. E, e, virüsle ilgili araştırma yapanların dışında herkes kampüs dışında olmak zorunda. Lablar kapalı yani. Fall semestri için bile Amerika'da bazı yerler e, online devam edecek diye duyuyoruz. Ha, ö- öyle gibi. Bizde de öyle olacak gibi. Henüz karar verilmedi ama büyük tamam. olasılıkla öyle. Olmasın bence de çünkü burası bayağı bir <gülüyor> sorunlu. Evet, evet. Yaklaşık 100 kadar katılımcımız oluyor. YouTube üzerinden de bir evet. o kadar. Yani toplamda 100'e varıyoruz. 50 kadar şeyde, Zoom'da, 50 kadar da YouTube üzerinde oluyor. Çok iyi. <gülüyor> Normal konferanslarda o kadar... Dinleyici bulmak zor aslında <gülüyor> şimdilerde. Zamana bakayım, zaman şey yapayım. Okay. Daha başlıyoruz da biraz. Dün, dün akşam izledim biraz. Ya yani akşam derken siz de sabah. <gülüyor> Filip, Filip, Filip'le e, Onur'u dinledim. Bu da saat dörde geldi. Sonra da uyudum. Evet. <gülüyor> Bir arkadaş da e, Kaliforniya'dan katılacak Kaltek'ten. O, o da bayağı şeydir. Her şey. Evet. <gülüyor> o, o Serkan Hocam bu kısımlar YouTube'dan evet. şu anda stream ediliyor mu? Ee, evet hocam. O zaman konuşmayalım. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> o zaman konuşmayalım. <gülüyor> Yok hocam ya. Yani gayet tatlı bir sohbet var. Tamam. <gülüyor> Kain Hocam, ben Emre. Ha, merhaba Emre, ne yapıyorsun hocam? İyiyim hocam, niye reddettiniz paper'ımızı yahu? <gülüyor> Paper'ım <Şaka. gülüyor> Bana gelmedi. <gülüyor> Nasılsınız, iyi misiniz? İyiyim, sağ ol Emre hocam, ne olsun. Karantina devam. <gülüyor> Aynen, orası, orası daha kötüymüş galiba. Baya kötü aslında. Baya kötü. Böyle de devam eder gibime geliyor. Bakalım. Anladım. E, elden her şey. E, dersler bitti. Sınavlar falan her şey bitti artık. Öğrencinin bize ihtiyacı da kalmadı. Lablar kapalı. E, bakalım ne olacak. Ya bizde de şey zaten her şey uzaktan eğitime döndü. Umarım push etmezler. <gülüyor> Ders, physical derse ihtiyaç yok deyip her şeyi online'a push etmezler umarım. Yani öyle bir şey olursa aslında şey dedi ki e, online olursa çok kişiye ihtiyaç olmayacak. Yeni employment olmaz. Onlar kötü olur. Türkiye'de evet. özellikle. Chat function'ı da kullanmadım ama nasıl bakacağım? Ee, şeyi nasıl yapıyoruz ee, Sevilay? Ee, 
Screen'i nasıl paylaşıyoruz? Her şey screen. Tamam alt tarafta yeşilmiş. Tamam. Teşekkürler. Şahin Hocam kendi e, go out of the share screen. Okay. Uh, tamam. Thank you. So we start in one minute. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, for again joining. Uh, so this is the last session uh, of uh, COVID-4. 
Uh, and my name is Ceyhun Bulutay from Bilkent University. Uh, I shall be uh, co-chairing this uh, last session together with Professor uh, Emre Taşkın from Hacettepe University. Uh, and uh, it's a great uh, honor for me to introduce our first speaker uh, of the session, uh, Professor Şahin Kaya Özdemir uh, from Penn State University uh, with the title of his talk, loss and non-hermeticity in quantum processes. So the floor is yours, Shahin Hocam. Uh, thank you, Jayhan uh, Hocam. So, and it's a pleasure to be with you on this Corona days. I hope everybody is doing good. Uh, so um, this will be my talk. Okay, I, I hope everybody is uh, now seeing my screen with, without any problem. Excellent. Great. So <clears throat> today I would like to basically blend two topics into each other and try to discuss some of the com commonalities between them. So in general, I will talk about what we have done in the past few years, almost close to a decade on uh, the behavior of quantum state in plasmonic systems. So the whole question was, uh, what will happen to the quantum correlations or coherences when we propagate them through plasmonic waveguides and plasmonic structure in general? Now, th this, uh, as we know, plasmonics is a lossy process. So that's why a part of my title is related with losses. And the second part of my talk is uh, my recent work related with non-hermeticity. So what will happen, or in principle, quantum mechanics is based on the foundation of hermeticity. So we have Hermitian systems and we look at the unitary evolution. Then the question would be, what happens to these losses, dissipation, the coherences in the system, and how we can manage them? Can we learn anything from those area which is called non-hermeticity and bring it to the quantum mechanics to see whether we can do anything interest. So I hope at the end of the talk, you will have an idea of where we are uh, going towards. So the whole discussion about plasmonics started, quantum states combined with plasmonics started with the hope that we can make everything compact to miniature sizes, even mic micro lengths or nanoscales and the quantum processes. In, in general, what we do when we deal with quantum and plasmonics, we either uh, quantize electromagnetic fields or we quantize the free electrons in the material. And we hope that this size and distance effects will give us unique behavior or functions. We also hope that using the plasmons, we can have very strong uh, interactions between the uh, plasmon, plasmonic field and single quantum em emitters. And at the end of the day, what we want to do, we want to build on cheap plasmonic processors and the hope that we will go and pass all these obstacles and build those quantum processing units on cheap in small scales. And we hope to use plasmonics. But the problem there is, okay, we, we know that plasmonics interacting with matter or emitters will give a strong interaction because of the confinement. But at the same time, plasmonic systems are lossy. So the questions were posed back to 2002, where a Leiden group, uh, I believe, they show that if you have a polarization entangled system and you pass it through a, a plasmonic uh, structure, the question was whether we can keep the quantum coherences or not. And the, quest, and the answer was yes. So what they did, they prepared this state, they passed it through this plasmonic structure and they, they, probe, they did quantum state tomography to probe the correlations. This was the first work. Was it surprising for most of us? Was surprising because we wanted the coherent losses to kill all the uh, quantum correlations, but it, it didn't happen like that because at the end of the day, the experiments that we build are based on post-selection. Basically, we, we only choose the parts that our detectors click. Later on, the concept has been were extended to have nanowires interacting with, with two-level systems. Uh, it was shown that yes, we have strong interactions and the plasmonic, uh, plasmonic waves or surface plasmons can basically propagate along these wires. The first proposals came in 2017 about uh, quantum plasmonic transistors. And in 2016, 
researchers, I think in, they are in Cambridge, they show that, yes, we can get single molecule uh, in, interacting with plasmonic field at the strong coupling regime. This very good. And then uh, there, there has been experiments since then, uh, 2019, 2005. So all through, throughout the decade, we see that different groups using different plasmonic structures, looking at quantum correlation and coherences in plasmonic system. Now, following this linear dispersion, uh, following this experiment recently in 2019, Edward Water Group at Caltech sh showed that even in highly dispersive regime, quantum correlations stays. No problem, we can preserve them. It was extended to pet entanglement and early in 2005, 2000 energy time entanglement, uh, pr uh, preservation of energy time entanglement in, quant uh, in plasmonic waveguides was shown in Jizan group in Switzerland. So what we learned from all these uh, experiments was that yes, plasmonic systems are lossy, but since we pick uh, only the cases where we have the, our detectors give us clicks, so the chosen parts, chosen subset of the whole, whole system tells us that uh, quantum correlations survives in these plasmic structures. We, we did this similar thing, but we said, okay, yes, quantum correlations are there, but what, what, what are the limits? So how long can we get a waveguide down? So plasmonic is lossy, but how bad is the losses in general? So we did, we follow similar steps. We generated single photons. We send one of the single photons to a sample where we have waveguides, plasmonic waveguides made of gold. So at different length scales, and we try to probe the, we look at the, we try to probe the quantum stuff states at the end of the uh, waveguide. So photons come, coupled into this plasmonic we got through the gratings, propagates and couple out, and we do measurements here. So what, what we have observed? We have observed that yes, our detection efficiencies are, has decreases, decrease because there are losses. Some, some of the times our photons will be lost. But when we have the clicks, when we get a click from our detectors, we know that those photons survived. And what we did, we look at the quantum statistics and we find that yes, statistics is typical single, single plasma, single show single photon, single plasma coupling, okay? But the question is how long can we choose our propagation length so that we have a reasonable amount of counts? So we did with different wave, waveguide lengths and we found that typically, 10 micrometers will be good enough to do all these experiments. So our single photons, when coupled to plasmons, a plasmonic system can propagate up to 10 micrometers. After that, the losses over, overcomes everything in the system, then your detection efficiency goes really bad. Is this a good length scale to do on chip quantum plasmonic processors? I believe this is a good, uh, a, a good length scale. At the end of the day, we are not, we don't want to use plasmonic circuits to do centimeter or millimeter length circuits. We want that circuits to be, or processes to be as small as possible. The, the next question was the bosonic or non-bosonic properties of plasmons. So we know from uh, phot photons that photons interfere. They show pongo mandel dip, right? So these are our uh, quantum interferences. Just to remind you what we mean with this, when we have a beam splitter and we input one photon at each of the inputs, those photons, both of those photons can be reflected. So photon comes to the beam splitter reflected, the other photon comes reflected. If I put detectors here, I will see a coincidence detection. Or both photons can, can be transmitted, pass through. And if I put detectors, I will see coincidence detection. But under certain co conditions, when we really make those photons indistinguishable, so when I send those two photons to the 50-50 beam splitter, those two photons will either appear or appear at one of, say, this output or the other output of the beam splitter. And we will see no coincidence detection. And this is what we call as a single photon or a photonic quantum interference. So the question was, if we, 
if we translate or transform these single photons into single plasmons, as we did in the previous case, can we see this quantum interferences or not? Answer, yes. What we did, we prepared plasmonic beam splitters. So these, these are beam splitters. We have input gratings here. One photon comes here, and the other photon comes to this input. They are translated, transformed into plasmons. Plasmons propagate, come to this midpoint. At this midpoint, we have a scattering process taking, kicking in. And then at the end of the day, plasmons coupled to these output gratings. And we have, at these output gratings, they turn into photons, and we do measurements on the photons, single photons. This was, I think, I believe this is the uh, earliest experiment where uh, researchers have basically probed these quantum interferences. And what was the result? The result was that, yes, they interfere. And they interfere because we, we observe, we look at the coincidence detections here at these outputs, what we expect. If they completely interfere, we expect a visibility of one. It means this dip will go to zero. Okay, but what we observed in this experiment is 0 0.72 visibility, which is larger than 0 0.5, which tells us that yes, indeed, quantum interferences takes place. What is happening here? Two photons translated or converted into plasmons. They go to a beam splitter, they interfere, single plasmons interfere there, and then they propagate to the output port, we convert them back into the photons and do uh, standard photon, photonic measurements. But it tells us, yes, plasmons are behaving like bosons. In principle, they are bosons. So therefore, they behave like uh, photons. So we can see quantum interferences. We were not the first to do, uh, we were not the only ones who showed did similar experiment. Indeed, one year earlier, there was this experiment in nature nanotechnology where researchers have attempted to do a similar experiment, but their visibility was around 43%. So is zero, less than 50%. This was mainly in the classical regime, indeed. But Harry Atwater's group, again, in Caltech, they did really a good experiments with dielectric loaded uh, surface plasma waveguides. So most of, the, most of the, their field was guided in the dielectric, but they showed, yes, they can take their visibility down to uh, up to 0 0.9. So showing that, yes, this single photons converted into sing single plasmons do indeed uh, exhibit quantum interferences. So these were the basic structures. Then we ask the questions, OK, those uh, these plasmon plasmonic structures, yes, we can keep the quantum coherences. We can keep the uh, correlations. They show quantum interferences. Can we use for other processes? Can we really go and find a uh, uh, process where the quantum photonics people are familiar and then translate it into the into the plasmonics field. And the first thing that come up come to our mind was entanglement distillation process because we had we had really a good experience in performing entanglement distillation experiments uh, field since two, year 2003. So what we did, we asked the question. So if Alice and Bob are specially separated from each other and they share a non-maximally entangled state. You see the epsilon here. If, if epsilon is one, then this will be a maximally entangled state. With arbi for arbitrary epsilon, we have a non-maximally entangled state. The question is, if Alice and Bob have access to their, to their uh, qubits only or to their photons only, can they distill or convert this non-maximally entangled state to a maximally entangled state? Such experiments were done in plasma, uh, in photonic domain uh, in early 2000. And the question is, yes, they can. We call the protocol as entanglement distillation protocol. And the whole idea here is the following. When we look at it, we see this coefficient here, different than the coefficient here, right? This is one, this is an arbitrary coefficient. Then the, uh, the process is that if we can induce losses losses in the sense that polarization dependent losses here, then we can make these two components of the superposition state equal to each other. Okay. So the whole idea was that, was that get this, uh, trans, uh, this operator and apply to one of, the, one of the sites. So for example, Bob 
applies the polarization dependent laws of strength epsilon. Okay, so this will be epsilon, and then they will be equal to each other, and we will, we will end up with a maximum entangled state. We did this. We, we tried to do basically uh, translate this idea to plasmonic domain, and we were quite sure that this will work because we know polariz plasmonics in principle in its foundation is polarization dependent, right? We have H polarized or V polarized responses in a plasmonic structures are in general beef. So what we did, we prepared this uh, array or metamaterial system of uh, this rectangular arrays of gold. And we did classical measurements showing that at this wavelength, yes, indeed, we, we have different transmission for vertical polarization and horizontal polarization. And for different structures, we get different transmissions. So this tells us that at this wavelength, we have a good control over the polarization dependent losses. Now, what we did, we get this um, metamaterial or the plasmonic structure put in one of the arms, say in Bob's arm, Alice's arm is here, we, we plug it there, and then we did quantum state tomography of transmitted light. What we, what we show, yes, first what we did was to characterize this uh, plasmonic channel. In order to do this, we did quantum process tomography. So basically we get specially prepared input states, we send to the system, we take the output, and then we try to construct this map here. And when we construct this map, we found out that yes, the operator, operator describing this plasmonic channel can be approximated with this function or with this state. So what it tells me, horizontally polarized light passes without any problem, but vertically polarized light will be scaled with this value. Yes, and we did it indeed. We did the full quantum state tomography characterizing this quantum channel, plasmonic channel. I think this is the first work uh, where a plasmonic channel uh, or a plasmonic device was characterized through a quantum process tomography. And we find that, yes, this map is correct and we can get fidelities to the ideal cases close to 0 0.9 or 90% fidelity. So we know how our plasmonic channels behave. Then we went and we did the plasmonic, we basically run the entanglement distillation protocol. We started with a state like this, epsilon is given by this. You look at the amount of entanglement in the system is 0.66. It really is not a high amount of entanglement. Fidelity to an ideal maximum entangled state is this one, 0.85. When we insert this plasmonic structure into one of the channels and go with the protocol, we could improve the entanglement of formation to 95, 0.95, close to one, and fidelity really increased in the same way. So this basically, this ex experiment told us that yes, we can use plasmonic structures for entanglement distillation. Instead of using bulk, bulk photonic uh, optical components, you can basically get one of these uh, thin layers of plasmonic structures and do your entanglement distillation protocol. We also observed that the uh, purity of the uh, purity of the input state is completely preserved during the process. I show you the results only from the non-maximum entangled state, but the same the same structure, the same protocol works for mixed states too. So this was, uh, I think, a, a good demonstration of how we can in, uh, we can use plasmonics for quantum processes. Later, we basically tried different protocols, different uh, directions. And one of the recent one that we come up was the random number generator. So basically these are plasmonic random number generator and they are like any, any quantum random number generator. So th the whole idea is the same. We have 50-50 beam splitter, plasmonic beam splitter photons are coming. We are detecting the photons in this port or this port. If this port uh, gives me photon, then I, I, this, I assign a, uh, cl a classical bit one. If the other, if the other one gives me a photon, then I assign a classical bit zero. And such a system, even if it's a lossy system, there are many problems with the loss related issues. It passes all the uh, tests that a good random number generation should pass. 
and our key generation rate was around 2.4 megabits per second. This was mainly uh, li was limited by the sources that we use. A high, high repetition uh, source, single photon uh, production rate will, gen will in general increase this key generation rate. So this was the plasmonic part of my talk. So you see that there is losses we, we and the whole idea there was that, yeah, even if you have losses in a system, you can continue and do some of the quantum processes uh, uh, that is typical in a uh, photonic system. Now, oh. I, I have a question here. Yes, yes. So what about, yeah, what about tri tripartite entanglement? For example, can you study GSD to W conversion by local operations? So in, in principle, we, we know that GAZ and W state are different classes, right? So by local operations and classical communication, we cannot convert them to each other deterministically. So indeed, we did lots of uh, research on photonic aspects of GAZ to W, W to GAZ uh, interconversion process. And we, what we found that if you are not confining yourself to the de determinism, if you allow some amount of uh, failure probability, then yes, you can convert GAZ to W state, W to GAZ state. In this, we had, we had a uh, early experiment where we show uh, we can do that probabilistically. And what we use, we use polarization dependent beam splitters. So the, the idea is that yes, these plasmonic structures are uh, or exhibit polarization dependent losses. And if we can utilize them properly, definitely we, we should be able to get GAZ, WW, GAZ interconversion in a probabilistic way. But uh, I, I don't want to say that it's an efficient process. So it, it was the interconversion process using polarization dependent beam splitter or losses in our experiments show that efficiency was very low indeed. Uh, there, there was a trade-off between fidelity to the ideal state and the probability. As the fidelity goes up, close to one, probability goes to zero. Uh, Dr. Rajan, is, is that okay for your? Okay, great. So my next topic is, I hope uh, I will convince you that this is a very interesting uh, direction. We have been uh, doing lots of experiments and theory along this direction. We have tried to marry quantum processes or quantum systems with non-hermeticity. So where we have an open system. In principle, our textbook says that it's a closed system. And I will, I will come to that the coherences, couplings, and how can we marry those two concepts to each other? I'm sorry, some of you, I, I believe, has already seen this slide. The question was China the job. following uh, ASCII. Uh, yeah. connect, connection has, uh, yeah, has right. some problems. So could you repeat your last uh, maybe three sentences, please? Because we could not uh, hear oh, okay. you. Sorry. It, it was about the WGSZ state? Uh, probably, probably about it. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. So what I wanted to say that, yes, uh, GZ to WGSZ interconversion is possible by polarization dependent losses. We did in photonics domain without pl using plasmonics. And we, what we found is there's a big, there's the trade off between fidelity and the efficiency of the process. When fidelity goes close to one, efficiency goes to zero and vice versa. And now the second, now from now on, I will talk about the second, uh, I will switch to my second part of my talk. This is about basically non-Hermitian processes. So the, the, the concept is the, is the following. So we know that our, systems in quantum mechanics that we study are Hamiltonians, Hermitian Hamiltonians, satisfying this relation and they conserve probability and unitarity. So we have real energies, real eigenvalues, no complex eigenvalues. This implies this. And whenever we have a complex eigenvalue measured in our system, we know that the system is open, there's loss or gain in the system and we term them as non-Hermitian system. Now the question was, can a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian have real eigenvalues? If yes, under what conditions? And this was asked and answered by this guy here, Carl Bender. And his research has shown that yes, under certain condition, non-Hermitian 
Hamiltonians can exhibit real eigenvalues. And that certain condition was termed as parity time symmetry. So your Hamiltonian should commute with P and T operators at the same time, okay? So once it is satisfied, when this condition is satisfied, then for a given range of parameter space or in a region of your parameter space, your system will give you real eigenvalues in the sense that when you look at only the eigenvalues, your system will look as if it is an Hermitian, a closed system. But if you change the parameter and then you go to another parameter, uh, another region in your parameter space, then you find that your eigenvalues become complex. Your, your system behaves as if it's an open system. And the transition between these two, well, if, if you start, if you have this knob of changing the parameter, then you find that there is a transition from this region to this region or vice versa through something called exceptional point. And the rest of my talk will be all about this exceptional point, how we utilize it. Now, many times I was asked, why do we study this PT symmetry and non-hermeticity? And I, I, I tried to make this, I, I went to the literature, I said, well, let me see what people think about it, right? And what I found is the following. It is everywhere in nature. So this doesn't mean that actually PT symmetric theory that we are trying to study is, the, is proven to be natural. But indeed, you see that those journals called nature is very fond of this phenomena. So it seems, it seems there's an interest in the scientific community to look at these specific symmetries and analyze what new features we observed when those symmetries are broken or maintained in a system. You will see, you go to any of these journals, you will see this zoo of applications, papers coming from different groups around, diff uh, around the world. And I think this was one of the interesting part where why people started going into this field because Nature Physics in 2015 uh, said that this uh, parity time symmetry in optics is one of the top 10 discoveries in the past decade. And this is here, you see is that parity time symmetry in optics. These are two circles. These are my our ring resonators coupled to each other. So I will show you how we do those experiments. And not only nature, but it's also an important concept in science and they are also very fond of it. So I feel like people get very much interested in this topic because they, we saw that there's a good interest in these high impact journals and in the, among the funding agencies. Yeah, many things have been done, many interesting features have been shown. But this is, this is the job part of it. The, the real important thing are the following. So we in general have mostly neglected this non-Hermitian subspace, right? We try to avoid losses. We try to avoid, avoid noises in our system. We, tr we try to uh, disconnect our systems from its environment as much as we can, because we think that they will deteriorate whatever process we are doing. But studies in this field have shown that indeed loss gain or the coupling can be all traded off between each other. So if you have good control on this, you can find new functionalities. And more importantly, losses, you shouldn't be scared of losses anymore. I will show you why. The losses can be turned into gain. So you can, if you have a way to deal with your losses, I'm not saying that you are trying to compensate it. I'm trying to say, if you have a mean to work with lo loss, then you will see that actually you can benefit from it. What type of things has been done? We control wave propagation, we control interactions, we enhance the uh, sensor's performance. And those are all coming from this unique behavior of the eigen energies in the, in the parameter space. For a Hermitian system, we have these two cones. These are basically eigen energies of the system. Two parameters are being changed. We see these two cones and a degeneracy called diabolic point here, like Dirac, Dirac point. And what happens here, you perturb your system, your perturbations perturbation will shift your uh, eigenvalues or open the gap linearly. 
Okay, but when you look at the non Hermitian system, you see this complex topology here. It's a Riemann sheet intersecting with each other. And when you perturb your system, it's no more a linear response, but you get this complicated square root behavior response. And the whole idea about this non Hermitian is making use of this uh, exceptional point. This is the exceptional point. What happens there? <clears throat> the system is non Hermitian, it's open. And at an exceptional point, it's a degeneracy where your eigenvalues are exactly the same. This is the same for Hermitian system too. You're here, your eigenvalues are the same. But what happens different than in non-Hermitian system is that not only your eigenvalues, but your eigenvectors also become the same at an exceptional point. Now, you start with a two-dimensional system at an exceptional point, you lose one of them. So you lose your dimensionality, your, your system becomes more prone to more open to perturbations. And we did a number of experiments in classical photon, uh, classical optics domain. And what we showed, we showed that, well, we can enhance the nonlinearities to do non-reciprocal transmission. We can control the losses by introducing losses. We kill an active laser, but further in putting losses, we can bring the laser back. We can do phononic lasers, we can, we can study fundamental concept in laser physics using exceptional point concept, we can enhance sensor response. And we also show that actually we can control the directionality of uh, lasers by bringing them to an exceptional point or pushing them away from an exceptional point. These are, these, all these experiments were really done in classical domain. What I had at the end of the day, I had two resonators coupled to each other. These are a silica resonator, very simple resonators. I change the distance between them, or I introduce loss or gain into the system to see what kind of new features I can obtain. But it is already, I think we know in the classical domain what type of features we expect we obtain. And the next quest is bringing those concepts, what we have learned in the classical domain to the quantum domain. So can, is there anything new for quantum information sciences? Now, if you ask this question, then we need to recall what we mean with that. Right? Quantum mechanics, as we discussed, accepts a Hermitian description as, as its foundation. And we also know noise or loss reduces the quantum correlation and coherences in our system. And parity time symmetry requires gain and loss balance. Above that, if you want to introduce a gain into a quantum system, you know that you cannot uh, put that without noise. So noiseless deterministic amplification is impossible. And this is a consequence of the uh, no clonic theorem in general. So all those things introduce quantum noise. So what we expect, we expect these exceptional points or PT symmetric concept to be a negative, to have a negative effect in our quantum information processing tasks. We have three Let's put it aside. I know, John. Three so go ahead. Okay, I will go very fast. So what, what, uh, what is, at, at the end of the day, let's put this aside and say, can we build a PT symmetric quantum system such that we have gain, we have loss, or we introduce some type of non-hermeticity without in improving, increasing quantum noise. So let me uh, give you some uh, directions in the field. So in 2018, we come up with this setup where we have a microwave uh, transmission line resonators coupled to two qubits. One qubit is basically introducing gain, the other is introducing the loss. And this is a theoretical work where we show that, yes, indeed, by introducing these qubits into this uh, circuit QED structure, we can show that we go, we go to a parity time symmetric broken or unbroken phase. Later on, actually, people have realized that all these non Hermitian Hamiltonians or PT symmetric Hamiltonians can be realized in any quantum system by using the Neumark dilation theory. So what you do, you have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, say a PT symmetric Hamiltonian, and you have a quantum system, you want quantum state, you want to evolve the quantum state under the action of that non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. What you do, due to Neumark dilation theorem, you add an ancilla. So you extend, you, you expand your Hilbert space. When you expand your Hilbert space, then that non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, okay, turn into a Hermitian form, and you let your state 
evolve under the effect of that Hamiltonian. And at the end of the day, what you do, you do a post-selection process. When you do that post-selection process, you will find that this state will be as if it is driven by a non-Hermitian Hamilton. And this has been demonstrated by a Chinese group in MV Diamonds, okay? And recently, uh, Kater Merch from Washington University in St. Louis has shown that in a, a transmond qubit, he can uh, get a similar dynamics. So he can probe a exceptional point in a superconducting, a superconducting quantum system. And in the photonic side, we have two coupled waveguides where waveguide, one of the waveguides is modulated to introduce extra loss. And people have shown that, yes, you can see Hongo Mandel deep type of processes in those systems. But all these systems are really does not tell you what kind of new processes you have. They just show you that you can find the presence or emergence of exceptional point. We want to go to another uh, direction. We, we ask the question, is there any unique quantum process which will be maintained or provided by exceptional points? And when there is no exceptional points in the system, that quantum process will die away, wash away. For that, we come up with an, uh, we decided to use one of the uh, earliest experiment results that we had, where we provide a non-hermeticity to a system, not by introduce, introducing gain or loss, but by introducing, introducing unidirectional coupling between two modes. So in this way, what, what, what, what, going, what is going on here is, is, the, is the following. So I have two modes in this system, clockwise and counterclockwise modes. I introduce scatterers into the system such that such that clockwise mode couples to counterclockwise mode, but counterclockwise mode does not couple to the other mode. Okay, so there's a unidirectional coupling between these two modes. And when you start looking at this, you find that actually for a resonator like this, I see multiple exceptional points and they are periodic. In a classical system in 2016, we showed that actually this, at these exceptional points, we have, we can control the propagation of light inside these resonators. Okay. Now we said, this is a dissipationless system. It means we don't add any dissipation into the system. So can we translate it into quantum domain? So we are now in the, we are now performing the experiment, but let me give you the theoretical background. What we have shown that this system gives a new rod to photon blockade effect, okay? But that photon blockade effect emerges when we have exceptional points. So we did a full quantum simulation of the system. So I have clockwise system, counterclockwise system. I have the scatterers which controls the coupling between these two modes. And what we have shown, yes, like in our previous work, we have exceptional point periodically uh, changes when we change this uh, distance or phase between these two scatterers. Then what we did, we get the whole quantum simulation where we added quantum noise, quantum jumps and everything we find, what we find that yes, in such a system, even if you in include quantum jumps and all types of quantum noises that can come to your mind, the locations of the exceptional points do not change. Now, what we did else, we said that let's assume that this is a highly nonlinear resonator, right? And if it is a high, highly nonlinear resonator, then we, know, we did know that nonlinear systems can exhibit or can be used to demonstrate photon blockade or so-called uh, unconventional photon blockade effect. So we try to look at how this system can be used for photon blockade. Can we- now, This, is, this was, up, uh, yeah, I am almost finishing. Thank you so much. Yeah. I am finishing, yeah. So what we have observed is the following. So we observe that when we don't have an exceptional point in the system, okay? When we don't have exceptional point in the system, I have unconventional photon blockade appearing in the system, right here and here, here and here, because this is a periodic way. And what, why is it like that? Because there is a destructive interference between two paths which to the exit, uh, say, to photon excitation. So these paths 
this direct path and this path basically uh, destructive interfere, so it blocks a uh, two-photon excitation process. But what we observe, when we induce, when we create an exceptional point, okay, when we bring the system to an exceptional point, here, a new photon blockade effect is seen. And what is surprising, this photon blockade effect, due to the exceptional point, is more robust to quantum noises. So this, will be, this is the main message I wanted to give you. So we are now, it's exciting time. Unfortunately, the lab is closed. We are now basically trying to realize this. We have shown that, we have shown that photon blockade effect here gives, or exceptional point gives a new path or new road to a photon blockade effect in a nonlinear resonator. If I take the exceptional point away, I end up with this unconventional photon blockade which is which deteriorates immediately when I increase the quantum noises in the system. Next, yes, we are doing the experiments. I hope I could convince you that these are exciting times for the non-hermitian community. Now we are trying to go into the quantum domain. And the question we ask is, can we benefit from, quant uh, can we benefit from the concepts of EP and PT in, for quantum information processing? And this photon blockade effect, to the best of our knowledge, is the first time a quantum process is shown to emerge from exceptional points. I stop here. Thanks for your patience. I have to say thanks to the uh, uh, sponsors. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. And thank you for your patience, dear Mitch. Shanjan, thank you so much. I uh, applaud for uh, all audience. Uh, and uh, let's take a few questions. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty. Uh, but uh, it was yeah, a please. bombardment of uh, <laughs> information. <laughs> yes. So, uh, any questions uh, for? Actually, I have, uh, and I have written uh, since uh, I cannot write the questions uh, since oh, I'm a moderator. So, <laughs> I will maybe it's better to ask directly. <laughs> okay. You know, you you were telling that that you you were sending single photons. Okay, in your first part. You were yes. sending single photons and they are converted to a uh, single plasmons in gratings. And afterwards you detect yes. them again as uh, single photons. And uh, you see that they are, uh, they, I mean, just they are sting single uh, photon. Yes. So uh, yes. their uh, quantum features are uh, conserved. Not conserved, but yes. okay. The, okay, the, the thing is that what how, how many photons you send and detect one plasmon, one single plasmon? I mean, is it related with the de decay rate of the plasmonic system or some? So so what what you are asking efficiency, right? Whenever I have loss, when I lose a photon completely, I don't detect anything, right? So yes. I run the experiment say uh, one million times, and I. Most of the time, no photons goes to my detectors after this interconversion process. I lose them. Okay. And if out of this one million, I get ten thousand of them arriving to my uh, detectors, then I say, "Well, it come." So I, I detect something and let me characterize using quantum state tomography its properties. Right. There's one so thing. Losses that... are there. The losses yes. are there. Losses. We don't avoid the losses, but. The, the way we perform the experiments is basically post-selected type of experiments, right? So you detect something, and when you say, when you detect something, you say, oh, process is went through. It went but through. The, ra the ratio is one percent, okay? But I have read your uh, paper, and uh, in this propagation time, it should have decayed much more than one percent. So there is something uh, not uh, there is something not also related with damping. Okay, now you converted the photons to plasmons. Okay, and plasmon yes. is yes. Uh, how to say propagating a little bit. Okay, then it is yes. converted again to photons. Okay, yes. and in yes. this uh, in this uh, land, uh, they uh, obey to do uh, plasmon decay. Okay, yes, Pla yes. decay. Uh, but the thing is that uh, plasmon decay, if you calculate, it is not one person. It should have been, for example, uh, 
for example, one per million or one per billion? Uh, look, uh, there are so many losses in the system, right? So you send a photon, grating. Grating has, does not have 100% conversion efficiency, right? coupling efficiency. Then you lose some of your photons there. Then they propagate, plasmonic losses kicks in, dispersion kicks in, you lose some of them there. Then it goes to your outcouplers, right? Outcouplers are lossy too. Then after that, it goes to your detectors. Your detectors are lossy. So at the end of the day, all those accumulates and you have a huge loss which decreases your efficiency. So this is typical in any experiments we do in photonics or this so-called plasmons, we see the same effect always. But what we see, losses are there. It can be a beam splitter loss, it can be a detector loss, it can be a channel loss. But at the end of the day, what we focus on the, are the subspace or the amount of experimental data we get when our detectors give us the correct click. When detectors give us the correct click, we keep that. The others are thrown away. And within that uh, uh, saved part, or those we correct, then we go and correct the detec detection cases. We go and do uh, whatever analysis we want to do, right? And what, when I said quantum coins are preserved, they are preserved only in that subspace that we select, right? Because the others, we don't know if they are lost. We don't have any information on that. Is that answer to your question? Yes, uh, oh, yes, okay. okay, thank you very much. There are two questions. Uh, sure. We are uh, quite over time, but let me read them. Uh, okay. Sadi Kubito just uh, has uh, this uh, question. Does uh, photon blockade mean nonlinearity at photon level? Can two qubit gates built with this? That's one question. So that is what we hope. <laughs> that, that is really what we hope. So photon, blo photon blockade has been shown by a number of researchers, including Attach and uh, other groups, that is a is a critical resource for quantum information processing, from single photon sources to uh, gate operations. So we hope that we hope that actually we can come up with a, with new types of quantum gates, which has not been covered in the Hermitian domain yet, by using the concepts of exceptional points. Now. The, this theoretical work is a kind of encouraging because really this was a surprise for us too. Uh, it turned out that this new rod emerges and this new rod gives us a better uh, robustness to quantum noise. So it, it, it is in interesting. For example, here you see uh, UPB, this is the unconventional photon blockade okay, without exceptional point. Okay, this is the semi-classical simulation result, and this is the full quantum simulation result. You see that immediately this ratio goes below one. It means you are not anymore in the photon blockade regime, right? Even in the uh, in the, in this regime, right? If there is no single photon blockade here. But if you see the exceptional for, exceptional uh, point based depend or uh, enabled photon blockade, you see that we have still the photon blockade effect, even if there is quantum noise in the system. Okay. This rod that we have discovered seems to be more robust to any type of noises in the system. And we hope that this can help us to build new quantum processors. Sharon last question, which I can't help okay, sure. uh, you know, reading uh, from Özgür Müstacaplıoğlu Hoca. Uh, about chiral quantum walk models, uh, are there any studies along this direction? In the in this domain, not really. I am not aware of. I am not aware of chiral uh, random quantum random walks. In general, quant quantum random walks have been uh, studied in the photons, right? With with the uh, anti photonic system with arrays of beam splitters, but as far as I know, I'm not, I am not aware of any work which uses this type of concepts, chiral concepts coming from exceptional points be used in uh, random walks. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any work. Okay, Sharon, we thank you once again. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, 
the, I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Uh, but we I, I, I will be here. I will be, we can sure. talk anytime. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And please uh, keep safe and healthy. OK, thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. I, I give my uh, place to uh, uh, Emir Tashkin Hoca for chairing the next talk. Thank you very much for this introduction. So, okay, now, okay, now uh, the next talk will be uh, by Zeki Seskir, and uh, he, he very uh, uh, actually he's a very important person for us because uh, he's working on the uh, landscape of quantum information and quantum technologies in uh, Turkey. So it will be a pleasure to uh, listen to him and uh, I let uh, the talk to him. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Really? Can you hear me, Emrojo? Yes, I, I do. Okay, so I will share my presentation. Uh, is everything okay? Can you see it? Yes, I, I can. Ah, okay. So initially, uh, I would like to thank everyone for uh, staying here. I think it has been around seven hours of presentations and it has been going very smoothly. I really want to thank the organizers and the chairs of this event uh, because I mean, for some time it was a little shaky whether we will have the event or it will be online and it has been going really great. I really want to thank everyone uh, for this. Uh, my work is, as M. Roger said, actually not uh, of quantum technologies, but on the academic literature uh, in quantum technologies. And it is basically a collaboration between the physics department and the technology policy department. Uh, this is basically my outline. I will very briefly explain what is scientometrics, which is basically the field of studying the scientific literature. Uh, mm -hmm. How did we collect our data? And then I will share with you my initial findings, uh, which are very basic things and non-basic things as it emerges. And then I will talk a little bit about Turkey, what is going on, where are we compared to the general uh, literature. And then I will uh, conclude my talk. Okay, so what is scientometrics? I think all of you have heard these things, you know, Web of Science, Scopus, Google Scholar, uh, Age Index, uh, impact factor, Q1, Q2, most of the things that make an academic's life hell. Uh, and it is basically the field that figures out those metrics. And the reason that we have this field is due to the one guy called Eugene Garfield. In 1955, he basically developed this thing called the citation index. And the reason that he developed this was to help libraries uh, to decide which journal to buy and which journal not to buy. So it was basically a cost cutting thing. And now it basically dominates the academia. Uh, and it is used widely for policy reasons as well. Uh, in this study, uh, we have used the following keyword query. Uh, you can find this in the uh, archive version of the uh, study. And uh, we used Web of Science to gather only the articles. We were not interested in proceedings, books, uh, or other kinds of academic products because uh, uh, published articles are, uh, they, they are basically robust. They went through the uh, peer review process. And we found something like 50,000 articles in the June of 2019. The number is now around 55,000. Uh, so this is a data, as you can see, it goes on and on and on. And if you structure it, it is still not nice. Uh, as you can see, it is rather uh, lots of, uh, let's say, lines in Excel. So how to make sense of this data? You need to use a couple of programs. Excel is your friend in you know, structuring the data. Uh, there is this Python pandas package. Uh, which is useful for constructing data frames. You use PyEC for small, uh, visualiza small visualizations of small networks. You use Vosfever for uh, larger networks and you use SciSquare tools for some other things. We used it for burst analysis. 
uh, let's start simple about uh, let's start with the number of articles there's this thing in chat but i cannot see it. why can't i see the chat okay um let's start with the number of articles uh, as you can see the total number of articles is increasing rapidly and it has been since the year almost uh, 2000 and uh, and then we checked the average number of authors per paper which which is basically a metric on uh, how collaborative is the field and the red line here corresponds to the full list if we limit the number of authors per paper to 50 we have this line and if we limit it to 10 we still have this line which means in all of the cases co-authorship is rising steadily and as you can see here uh, as of 2013 the mod of number of authors per paper is three which means the entire chunk of the literature here consists mostly of uh, papers with three authors uh, previously to that it was two and as far as i can uh, see from the data it was never one so single author papers uh, were never the dominating uh, type of articles and when you run a country level analysis you see that china has most of the articles which is closely followed by us and then england and germany and france and so on uh, and if you combine the entire Europe, and even if you exclude England because of Brexit, basically uh, these three are almost on par. They have similar amount of uh, contribution to the literature, which is around 30% or, or let's say 28 to 30% for each of them. Uh, and then if you look at the co-authorship analysis of the countries with more than uh, 10 published articles, uh, you can see basically researchers from which countries are collaborating with researchers from uh, which other countries. You can see China here, uh, which is basically collaborating with uh, Middle East and with Korea and Italy. And you have the you have the usual suspects. Uh, I, I think this is Singapore. For some reason, there is no name. And you can see Turkey here uh, with uh, India and Brazil and Mexico. Uh, and he, we did the institutional level analysis as well, and this is the top 12 institutions with uh, publications in our data set. Uh, the thing about Chinese Academy of Sciences that we have to, uh, well, we have to consider them in a special case because this is basically uh, one fourth of almost entire literature in China since not 20%, 25% of entire researchers in China are working in Chinese Academy of Sciences. This is due to the fact that most Chinese researchers have multiple affiliations, uh, so that the numbers uh, here uh, is high. But this, I mean, they, this doesn't change that China has more than uh, one third of the literature. And again, if you run the co-authorship analysis for organizations with more than 150 published articles, you can get, you get this thing. Uh, here, you can see that the Chinese institutions are really close together. They collaborate internally uh, much more strongly than their uh, international collaborations. A similar thing can be said for Japan as well. And here you have basically uh, the rest of the world. You have Europe here, US, uh, Australia and Canada. And Singapore is, of course, a very important country in our field. And you can see that it kind of forms its own uh, cluster. And also Russia can be seen uh, in here as another cluster. And then we followed this by looking at the keywords uh, in titles and author keywords. Uh, and if two of the keywords appear together, they appear here with a line between them. And as the number of occurrence increases, the line gets thicker and the number of number of occurrence of the term gets higher, yeah, the dot gets bigger. And from here, you can see that the, the, actually the literature can be clustered into three uh, very uh, dense uh, clusters of keywords. 
Uh, I interpret this red uh, part as physical realizations, uh, not just experimental things, but uh, basically uh, solid state physics and physical realizations of theoretical concepts in our field. Uh, this, this blue uh, cluster is more uh, related to quantum optics and communication and cryptography. And this green cluster is more about computation and quantum information theory. Uh, but 200 is kind of a high number. If you lower that to basically increase your precision, you have uh, something that is less clear, but you can see a fourth cluster uh, beginning to emerge. And this cluster is basically more about um, theoretical concepts. Maybe uh, quantum thermodynamics will emerge from here uh, compared to the other clusters. Uh, and we continued with burst analysis in the field, which means that whether a topic is gaining attraction. Uh, and you can see here that with a lower density parameter, which means only big burst can be seen, uh, this is the field. Uh, and it starts with quantum computation, entanglement, quantum computer, teleportation, quantum computing, cavity QAD. For some reason, there's this huge entanglement boost here, and then it evolves as time goes, quantum correlations, discord, and so on. Uh, with a higher density parameter, which allows you to see smaller bursts, you get 69 keywords. Uh, you can see the entire list in the archive version. And here, I just put the ones that are still ongoing, the bursts that are still ongoing. and. Uh, I think you can uh, remember this from Professor Cominis's uh, talk that quantum coherence is getting a really uh, important place in the literature. And these are kind of usual suspects. I was kind of surprised by ADS-CFD, but then I talked with a couple of friends and they said that ADS-CFD is being used everywhere. So it's just, uh, you should just expect it to uh, be used in your field as well. Uh, and well, I didn't trust the software tools, to be honest, and I wanted to check it whether it holds. So this is basically frequency analysis. Uh, I use these three, and uh, you can see that the, basically the bursts hold. I mean, you can see that these uh, keywords are gaining attraction. I, I wanted to compare them with another keyword that is not gaining attraction, and it's quantum teleportation. And as you can see, it is kind of mainstream. It is, it is just there. Uh, it's not bursting. It's not fading away. It's just around. And if you compare it with quantum computing, again, for some reason, at 2009, it has a huge, uh, let's say, uh, increase. And then uh, it went to normal. And you can see that these are uh, very small compared to quantum computing. So what about Turkey? Uh, I run the numbers of- I'm sorry. Uh, ah, okay. uh, Zeki, you have three minutes. Okay, this, this is my one of my last uh, four or five slides. Okay, thank uh, you very much. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, so about Turkey, uh, you can see that, uh, so you, you can ignore these parts because they are basic outliers. There, there were like five or six uh, articles there per year. Uh, but uh, in Turkey, we are uh, collaborating less. Uh, in comparison to the international literature. The number of articles is increasing from Turkey, but it is not increasing rapidly enough to make, give a competitive advantage in the international literature. And our contribution to the overall uh, literature, although it has increased, uh, it is still around 0.4%, uh, which is rather low for a country with uh, 80 million uh, people. And uh, very quickly, the collaboration networks thing, this is from my thesis from Science and Technology Policy Studies Department. Uh, each dot corresponds to a single author, and the size of the dot means that they have more papers in the literature. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have that much paper, but the number of papers in the data set that we have. And the networks doesn't mean that entire network is located in Turkey. For example, in this network, there's only a single author from Turkey. Uh, so the networks basically means that how internationally uh, integrated you are. Uh, most of the network from here are from Turkey. Uh, you can guess uh, most of the people there. 
Uh, I compared it with South Africa, Portugal, Portugal, and Saudi Arabia because they have similar metrics with Turkey in terms of GDP and population. And you can see that they are much, uh, well, they are better uh, stationed in international collaboration than Turkey. Turkey has a very uh, sparse uh, network collaboration map. Uh, you can just check this from the paper. We found 34 core articles or uh, works of scholar scholarly work that kinda is the core corpus of this entire field. As you can see, Nielsen Chang's book it has the most of the citations, which is followed by Bennett, Eckhart, you seen uh, the EPR paper. And here in the highly cited works, it is Kimball's work, Valarov, Nayak, and Orodechki. Well, they are the uh, people that you can imagine. So what are the takeaway messages? The field is highly dynamic for the last decades. There are lots of new topics emerging, but it is not, a yet, not yet an established field. There is this rule called Pareto distribution or the 8 to 20 rule uh, concerning the number of journals and the number of articles. The field does not fit to that distribution, which means that the field will still evolve. It is not an established field like nanotechnology. Uh, also, the literature has been becoming steadily more collaborative for the last 30 years. Uh, there are three or maybe four, depending on the precision, main clusters of research areas. Uh, there is no clear winner of this race yet. So Europe, US and China uh, are still racing. Uh, Chinese and Japanese institutions uh, more heavily collaborate on national levels, uh, but Europe and US basically they collaborate on international levels more. So what about Turkey? Uh, number of articles increasing, but not rapidly enough. And we collaborate less and we are part of fewer large research networks in terms of international networks. Uh, you can see these two studies uh, for the most of the things that I've used here. And you can just check us. I, I'm out of time, but you can check uh, this work. And I want to thank you for listening and I will act uh, I, if you have questions, please ask. We thank uh, this Zeki uh, one more time. Uh, sorry, not one more time. This is the first yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, for this timely talk and uh, interesting talk, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, please raise them uh, from uh, question and answers part. Uh, otherwise, I will move to the second. Yeah, you can ask me. Okay, the there well. is, there is. There is a question, yeah. and uh, Sevilla writes me, and from Grandier. Huh. Uh, can, how, how can I take the question? <laughs> uh, I cannot see the question. Ah, okay. Okay. For any scientific domain, some kind of saturation, stabilization in the number of papers is expected. Nothing like that here. Yeah, the field is not established yet. I mean, the number of new articles is increasing every year and it doesn't even fit the distribution of, the, I mean, the number of journals is not even established yet. So the field still has a way, long way to go before becoming a really established or saturated field. Uh, you can check those things by using certain metrics uh, like the distribution, uh, and you cannot uh, see them in the literature uh, right now. But uh, uh, it's Philippe Granger. Are there other examples of that? Like after uh, it's, uh, let's say, um, 20, 25 years, 30 years, we are still in a growing uh, stage. Is it usual or, or not for in the bibliometry? Uh, Usually the trend is that the number of articles is always increasing, but it, the, the number of articles each year at some times becomes kind of saturated for yes. fields that are dying or fields that have become so mainstream. Uh, but this is a very new field. For example, uh, I did... very new. <laughs> Yeah, it's really, it's really new compared to the other ones. For example, biochemistry is still considered an interdisciplinary field, but it has been around for decades and it's the, uh, it is kind of established. You can apply those metrics to here because it is really, biochemistry is something really uh, studied in the scientometric uh, groups because it's basically born out of chemistry. Uh, and uh, you can actually see those things. 
uh, quantum technologies right now is really heavily dependent on physics journals. Uh, like it has really only a couple of journals that are on top uh, 12 uh, now that you can see that it is the fields journal like quantum information science and technology and uh, mostly the papers are published in physical review uh, and uh, PL I, I think uh, no but did I answer your question or uh, yes I just, I yeah. think. Oh, thank you thank you is there any more questions uh, okay uh, we thank, thank you. Zeki again uh, for his nice talk and uh, and uh, let's you. move to the next speaker. Uh, okay, now. Okay, what was done here? Okay, let me share my screen. Ah, okay. Okay, now uh, we move, move to uh, the talk by Art Spiegel. Uh, he's from California Institute of Technology. This is our last talk. Uh, it's an interesting talk because uh, I have always uh, been uh, known these superconducting uh, qubits uh, with microwaves, but now uh, microwave uh, frequencies. But now he's gonna talk about how they emit, uh, they generate photon in the optical regimes. Uh, Alp, could you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, maybe uh, if possible. Ah, okay, I see yeah. you. All right, great. Uh, then maybe we can start. Perfect. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. Let me just pull up my slides. All right, yeah. Can everyone see, the, can you see the slides? Hear me, see me, is everything good? Yes, yes, okay, it seems great. fine. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I know it's late and it's been a long day. I I'm connecting from Los Angeles today. So I unfortunately could not attend most of the talks, uh, but uh, it seems like everything is going really nicely uh, from what I've heard in the past couple of talks. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for the introduction. I'm Arif Sipaygit. I'm currently a postdoc in Oscar Painter's group at Caltech. And what I want to do today is to tell you about some of our very recent results on generating optical photons from a superconducting qubit. As you've heard, superconducting qubits are electrical circuits that operate at low temperatures and microwave frequencies. And in this talk, how I'll describe how we can take single photons uh, from a superconducting qubit and use nanomechanical resonators to convert these single photons from microwave frequencies to the optical domain. And the motivation for what I'm going to talk about is really driven by a lot of the ideas that I already mentioned uh, earlier uh, today in this, in this conference. And the, this motivation is to make use of quantum mechanical effects like superposition and entanglement to do useful tasks in computation, communication, and sensing. Uh, I'm not going to kind of uh, touch on these again, because I think you already heard uh, several talks on various aspects of quantum science and technology today. What I want to focus on today in this last talk is to discuss how we can build devices or large scale quantum machines that can do these quantum information processing tasks. And to do that, there are two key ingredients. One, we need to be able to isolate individual qubits um, so I, I don't think I need to introduce what a qubit here, uh, a qubit is uh, to this community. But one of the things I want to highlight is that when we realize qubits, uh, where we can create these arbitrary superposition states, we want these superposition states to be stable over a very long time scale, such that we can store quantum information. And this requires us to realize very isolated quantum systems. In other words, we want these systems to be only weakly interacting with their environment such that the coherence processes are suppressed. So that's one thing we'd like from our uh, quantum devices. And the second thing we'd like is that we want to be able to connect these uh, individual qubits with each other such that we can realize two qubit gates. Um, and in order to do this, we need to find ways to realize strong interactions between different qubits. So these two requirements of simultaneously having to realize weak interactions with the environment and strong interactions between qubits seems really hard. This, this almost looks somewhat contradictory. And this is one of the reasons why it's really challenging to build a large scale quantum computer. Um, and that's where a lot of the experimental challenges lie uh, in this field. So in the following, what I want to do is kind of give some examples from uh, device platforms that I've worked with uh, in the past, just to highlight this trade off between strong interactions and coherence in uh, quantum devices. So, one of the examples uh, is from superconducting qubits. 
these are the kinds of devices that are being uh, explored uh, by companies like Google, IBM, and Bigetti for building quantum computers. These are macroscopic electrical circuits uh, based on superconducting elements and Josephson junctions. And one of the nice things is that because they're macroscopic circuits, you can engineer their properties uh, quite well and realize fast and high fidelity logic operations. But because they're macroscopic quantum objects, uh, they also interact with many environmental degrees of freedom. So they typically display short coherence times uh, compared with, let's say, other, type, other types of uh, spin qubits or uh, neutral atom qubits, for instance. And on the other side uh, of the spectrum, there's other systems like nuclear or electronic spins in solids. Uh, these, uh, are, these systems can have extremely long coherence times at the second to minute time scale. But uh, these systems, uh, on the other hand, cannot uh, realize strong interactions with one another. So you can store quantum information for a long time, but it's harder to get these different spin degrees of freedom to interact. Uh, that's, that's a much weaker process. And then finally, there are optical photons. These are great for transmuting quantum information over long distances. So they're natural for communication tests, but they don't naturally interact with each other. So I guess what I'm trying to highlight here is that there we have several platforms that have their own advantages, but there's not a single platform that's uh, simultaneously good for storing, processing, and communicating quantum information at the moment, at least. Uh, so one uh, of the approaches that I've been quite uh, interested in is to study hybrid device architecture, uh, where the main idea is to make use of different physical degrees of freedom for different information processing tasks. For instance, we could use superconducting qubits as our processor, and uh, systems like nuclear and electronic spins as our memories to store quantum information and then use optical photons to communicate uh, over long distances. This is in some ways similar to how our normal computers work. We have a memory unit, we have a CPU unit, and then we have some communication unit. And in the quantum domain, the challenge now is to see if we can find ways to convert quantum states between, different, between these different physical degrees of freedom. Um, so that's part of, uh, that's a very active area of research uh, in the uh, community right now. Uh, during my PhD, I worked on uh, developing interfaces between single spin or single atom based quantum memories and single optical photons. So these were experiments uh, that we did uh, in Misha Lukin's group uh, at Harvard. But uh, today, what I want to focus on is some very recent work uh, that I was involved in in Oscar Painter's group where we developed an interface between superconducting quantum processors and optical photons. And the main motivation here uh, for this work is the following. Superconducting qubits operate at very low temperatures inside dilution refrigerators, and they're at microwave frequencies. So you can't take single microwave photons outside of a fridge and send over long distances with a cable. If you do that, the, the thermal noise at microwave frequencies will dominate uh, and it will it will overwhelm the quantum signal. So the, the domain at which we can do this is in the optical domain because losses are very low and there's no thermal noise. So what we want to do is to develop a converter that can convert single microwave photons to the optical domain such that we can share or send quantum information over long distances between different superconducting quantum processors. Okay, here's an outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to first give an introduction to uh, superconducting qubits, I think, uh, Today's talks earlier were mostly on optics and atomic systems uh, and, and photonics. So hopefully this will be entertaining uh, uh, to many of you. And in the remainder of the talk, I'll discuss how uh, we build devices that uh, can realize this conversion task from a superconducting qubit to optics using mechanical quantum systems. Okay, superconducting circuits are uh, electrical circuits that operate, that are built based on superconducting elements. The simplest example is an LC oscillator where you have an inductor and a capacitor that forms a, a resonator. And to understand the quantum mechanical uh, response of the system, we can write down a Hamiltonian where you have this phi square term that denotes the magnetic energy stored uh, in the inductor and then the Q square term that, um, that uh, corresponds to the electric energy uh, stored in the capacitor. Well, this Hamiltonian looks very much like the Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator uh, uh, where you have some X square and P square terms well, based on this analogy, we know what the solutions uh, of this uh, harmonic oscillator problem is. Uh, the eigenstates of the system are going to be states that are evenly spaced uh, in energy. So these different eigenstates labeled 0, 1, 2, and 3, we will call these uh, eigenstates uh, microwave photons. So state 1 
refers to uh, a single microwave photon state. And the transitions between zero and one and one to two are at, this, are at the same frequency. And this frequency in this circuit is given by the LC resonance frequency of the, this electrical circuit. Okay, so LC circuits are things that you use uh, every day. So how are these quantum mechanical now all of a sudden? Well, to make them quantum mechanical, the first thing we need to do is to uh, remove all the thermal excitations out of the system. So in other words, we need to make sure that the KT is much smaller than the H bar omega, which is the transition frequency here. Uh, for practical reasons, we fabricate or realize these uh, superconducting resonators around five gigahertz. That's where you can find um, equipment more easily, uh, test equipment more easily. So if you choose your omega naught to be in the five gigahertz range, then you, it means that you need to operate at temperatures lower than 300 millikelvin. If you do that, if you do these experiments inside a dilution refrigerator, then if you satisfy this condition, you can polarize your system to the ground state and realize a pure quantum mechanical system uh, in where you don't have any thermal excitation. So this is the kind of the starting point for making a, a quantum harmonic oscillator. But then it's not enough to realize qubits. Uh, in order to make qubits, we need to be able to isolate two levels, whereas here we have many levels. And if we, for instance, start exciting the system from zero to one, because it's a linear oscillator, the, we're going to uh, keep exciting the system from zero to one, one to two, two to three, et cetera. So it's not going to realize a two level system. In order to do that, uh, it turns out we can use uh, these objects called Josephson junctions. So Josephson junction is an element where you have two superconducting islands that are separated by an insulating barrier. And for our purposes, if you look at the, the, the response of a Josephson junction, we can consider it as an effectively a very nonlinear inductor where the relationship between the phase and the current is very nonlinear. Um, and because of this nonlinearity, we now have a Hamiltonian that de deviates uh, from the harmonic oscillator potential. And now that the uh, harmonic potential, uh, harmonic oscillator potential is modified, these, two, these different eigenstates are going to have uh, transition frequencies that are not equal to each other. So transition fre frequency from zero to one will be different from the transition frequency from zero, uh, from one to two. So this is what was also referred as photon blockade. So this is essentially a way to get photon blockade in, in the microwave frequency regime where you have uh, single photon level nonlinearities due to the Josephson junctions. And um, compared with the optical case, this is much easier uh, to realize. Uh, it has, you need to go to low temperatures, so there's challenges associated with that, but uh, these elements are very, very nonlinear. Um, and based on this photon blockade, we can realize effective two-level systems based on uh, these macroscopic electrical circuits. So in Oscar's group, we follow the pioneering work by uh, Yale and Santa Barbara groups to realize such superconducting so-called transmon qubits. Here's an SEM image of such a qubit fabricated in our group where the area shaded in orange uh, shows a superconducting island that is capacitively coupled to the ground plane. So that's kind of this capacitor part of this electrical circuit. And then we also fabricate Josephson junctions such that we can get the nonlinear behavior uh, that we want. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how we do this. Uh, I'd be happy to chat if you're interested. Um, but you can see from this picture that these qubits are really macroscopic objects. They're at the 100 micrometer scale. And these are things that we can uh, use, we can define and engineer using standard lithography techniques. Uh, this is really nice. You can choose the transition frequency and the amount of nonlinearity by changing the dimensions of these electrical circuits. And if you bring many circuits, uh, many such elements close to each other, for instance, if you fabricate an array uh, of these uh, devices, then you can engineer this interaction strength between these artificial atoms. Uh, so just using standard lithography techniques, therefore, you can realize qubit-qubit interactions um, and qubit-photon interactions uh, if you in start including linear microwave resonators in the system as well. So these two uh, ingredients, qubit-qubit uh, -qubit interactions and qubit-photon interactions, are essentially the building blocks that people are using to realize quantum computers based on superconducting qubits. Okay, with, before moving, I want to give a kind of a short uh, summary of where the, the state of the art in the field is. Uh, so there's been a tremendous amount of progress in this field over the last decade. And uh, last year, you probably heard about these results. Uh, Google's uh, effort was able to realize um, devices where they had a two dimensional array of 53 qubits and they could realize high fidelity gates with gate fidelities larger than 99%. So very roughly the architecture, architect, their architecture looks something like the following. 
where each one of these cross-shaped structures corresponds to a qubit, and each one of these qubits interacts with its nearest neighbor. So you can you have this 2D grid where you can realize two qubit uh, logic operations among nearest neighbor qubits. But uh, the story is far from complete, and we have a lot of uh, open challenges ahead to realize uh, a fault-tolerant uh, quantum computer. Just to list a few, um, one of the challenges is that these qubits are large. Uh, they're essentially microwave resonators, which are quite large in size. They're at the 100 micrometer to millimeter scale. And based on the current error rates that we have, if you want to run an algorithm, like the factoring algorithm, you need millions of these. So this would mean a really large uh, devices and wafers that you have to uh, fabricate with very low, um, with, with very high uh, yield. A second challenge is that these systems uh, have relatively short coherence time, so errors uh, occur somewhat frequently. And finally, one of the things I'm going to be focusing on this talk is that all of these operations have to be done inside uh, special cryostats. So here's, I'm showing you an image of uh, one of the dilution refrigerator setups that are uh, used, uh, that's used in uh, Google's efforts. So um, you can see the amount of wiring that goes into uh, building up such a quantum computer. And the chip itself is, is something very small. It's only a few centimeters, but all of the operations and uh, gate operations that you do have to be done at this low temperature stage of a dilution refrigerator. And at the moment, we don't have a way of extracting quantum information out of the systems. For instance, if we wanted to network many quantum computers, we don't have a way of doing that right now. Um, so in today's talk, I'll discuss a new component that we are developing, which allows us to convert quantum states from these electrical circuits and uh, convert them to the optical domain such that we can send quantum information over long distances using optical fiber links. So here's the main challenge I'm going to discuss uh, today. So we want to go from a superconducting qubit to a single optical photon. And the main uh, question is, how do we do that? Uh, this is a very challenging task because the, the microwave photon and the optical photon are at completely different frequencies. One is at 5 gigahertz, the other is at 200 terahertz. If you treat this as a problem in nonlinear optics, this is a very interesting quantum frequency conversion task. And these photons, they don't naturally interact with each other. So we need to find a way to create effective interactions um, in an efficient way between these uh, single photons. And I'll discuss a way uh, where we realize such um, interactions using a mechanical resonator as an intermediate element. So the main idea here is that we're going to design a mechanical resonator and we're going to electromechanically couple it to a superconducting qubit. And at the same time, we will realize optomechanical interactions between the mechanical resonator and an optical resonator. So we will use this as an intermediate element to transfer information uh, from a superconducting qubit to the optical domain. OK, um, so in the remainder of the talk, I'll take you through various components of this quantum transducer. The first component that I want to introduce uh, today is the tool, is the question of how we can convert phonons to photons using optomechanical interactions. Uh, here's a toy model to describe uh, the coupling of mechanical motion uh, with light. In this model, we have an optical resonator. Uh, this is a fabry perot resonator, except uh, unlike a regular fabry perot we now have a, a configuration where the back mirror is free to oscillate. So as this back mirror uh, undergoes some displacement by delta x, it changes the total size of the optical resonator. So you can see that the mechanical motion of this back mirror is going to change the frequency of the optical oscillator. And this gives rise to a parametric interaction between these two systems where uh, we can describe the, uh, the interaction uh, using this Hamiltonian. The term on the right uh, tells us the frequency of the mechanical oscillator at frequency omega m. The omega naught term is the bare resonance frequency of the optical resonator. And the interaction is described by this red term over here. This essentially tells us how much of a frequency shift we get for unit displacement uh, of the mechanical resonator. And we can express this displacement operator in terms of the creation and annihilation of phonons in this mechanical resonator. And then we, uh, in the end, once we do these substitutions, we end up with the interaction Hamiltonian of the following form. Um, this is a nonlinear interaction where the GOM tells us physically how much of a frequency shift we get per uh, uh, single phonon in the mechanical resonator. OK, so we have this nonlinear interaction. How can we make use of it to convert phonons to photons? Um, so for those of you familiar with uh, nonlinear optics, this is essentially a three-way mixing process. And the way to convert uh, a mechanical excitation 
to the optical domain. In order to do that, we're going to use a parametric process where we inject a pump field at frequency omega L. And then this pump field is going to induce some mean field response in the optical uh, resonator. So we'll denote this as uh, the intracavity field uh, alpha. And on top of this mean field response, there's going to be fluctuations that are induced uh, due to the mechanical motion. So these quantum fluctuations, we will refer to them as delta A uh, in terms of uh, the response that's generated due to the presence of the mechanical mode. So if we inject, inject this pump field uh, and then we look at the uh, fluctuations uh, around this uh, mean field uh, alpha, then we see that we end up with interaction terms between uh, the mechanical mode B and the optical field uh, delta A. So this is a so-called beam splitter Hamiltonian, which shows you that you can have coherent exchange of information between uh, field B and uh, field A. Then this is how we're going to exchange uh, phonons with photons in a coherent manner. And kind of a, to give a physical intuition as to what's going on here, once we inject a pump field due to the interaction with the mechanical oscillator, uh, this, the mechanical resonator induces modulations of the optical field. Um, and these modulations therefore create a sideband on the pump field that you're generating. So, and in this uh, setup, we choose our detunings of our laser such that we can uh, resonantly amplify one of the scattering processes. And we end up with the following up conversion process where we can convert a phonon at frequency omega m. We combine it with a pump field to create a new optical photon at the sum frequency. So that way we can convert uh, new photons at the sum frequency. And the only way we could do this is if we combine one photon at frequency omega L and one phonon at frequency omega M. So that's kind of the intuition behind um, this conversion process. And for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to denote uh, this uh, interaction, phonon-photon interaction with the following cartoon image to indicate that we can couple phonons and optical photons. Okay, so this was a toy model so far. How do we realize this uh, in the lab? So in Oscar's group uh, at Caltech, they've already developed uh, ways to realize such strong phonon-photon interactions using uh, photonic crystal cavities. So here I'm showing you a one-dimensional nanobeam that's suspended in free space. And if you, if you pattern this structure in a way that modulates the refractive index uh, and the mass density, you can create Bragg mirrors. So by modulating uh, the refractive index in a periodic manner, we can create Bragg mirrors. And these mirrors essentially create a Fabry-Perot type resonator here. So that way we can trap electromagnetic radiation between these uh, two end mirrors. But at the same time, because, uh, because we're modulating uh, the mass density in a similar way, we can also co-localize mechanical excitations in the same volume. So this is a structure where you can localize optical fields uh, at 200 terahertz and mechanical modes at five gigahertz into the same volume. And whenever you can co-localize different modes uh, into the same mode volume, they, it means that you uh, have strong field overlaps and this gives rise to strong interactions. And in, this, in these kinds of structures, just to give you a sense of the strength of the interactions, about a femtometer uh, displacement of this mechanical mode. So this mechanical mode I'm showing here corresponds to a breathing type of motion of this uh, nanobeam. And if you have a, only about a femtometer of displacement of this uh, breathing type of motion, it still corresponds to a very large frequency shift in the optical uh, frequency. So we get about the megahertz level shift. So this, these nanoscale structures are, these nanophotonic uh, cavities are what we will use to convert phonons to photons uh, in the remainder of my talk. Okay, so I told you how we can go from phonons to photons. And the last ingredient is to put all these things together and see if we can uh, go from a qubit to mechanics and then to optics. So. These phononic and photonic crystals were already developed in Oscar's group uh, already about a decade ago. And when I started uh, working uh, with Oscar a few years ago, one of the ingredients that was missing was a way to couple qubits to phonons in a way that's compatible with these silicon optomechanical crystals. So how can we put uh, these qubit phonon converters as well as phonon photon converters into a monolithic device platform? That was one of the open uh, questions. So in order to do that, uh, I'll first present you a, a kind of the high level idea uh, for our approach. We again start with this cavity optomechanical setup, but except now, in addition to this cavity optomechanical setup, we're going to add a piezoelectric material on top of this, uh, of this deformable mirror. So in now the, the displacement of this back mirror is going to do two things. It's 
again going to change the length of the optical cavity. But at the same time, as this mirror undergoes some displacement, it is going to induce charge on the piezoelectric material due to the piezoelectric interaction. And then if we can wire up this piezoelectric transducer to a superconducting qubit, then we can realize uh, interactions between the qubit and the mechanical resonator that's going to be piezoelectrically uh, mediated. And then we still have access to phonon-photon interactions via this uh, optomechanical setup. So this is kind of the main idea uh, for uh, what I'm going to describe uh, uh, later on in my talk. And experimentally, the challenge here is that there's many challenges here. And so we have lots of components here. We want to find a way to integrate superconducting qubits, piezoelectric transducers, and uh, silicon uh, photonic and phononic crystals in a single device platform. So that we like to develop a monolithic device uh, that can do all of these tasks. Uh, so it took us about a year or so to develop uh, the material and fabrication protocols to do this. But we, in the end, we ended up with the following approach. Uh, so we started with a material stack of the following form where we have a 300 nanometer layer of aluminum nitride. That's our piezoelectric uh, layer. That's where we do the piezoelectric transduction. And underneath that, we have the silicon device layer where this is where we will fabricate mechanical and optical devices. And after eight layers of uh, nanofabrication, we can fabricate devices that have uh, piezoelectric transducer, uh, superconducting qubits, and silicon optomechanical crystals on suspended membranes. So this is a lot of hours spent in the clean room, but uh, all, all of these steps are well defined and operate with uh, work with high yield. So we can now make these um, types of devices in about 10 days or so in the clean room. Okay, so this is what our uh, qubit to optics transducer chip looks like. Actually, all of the science takes place in this small area over here. That's where the qubit mechanics and optics is. And the rest of the system is just for guiding microwave and optical excitations uh, in and out of the system. Here's a zoom in to uh, where the qubit, uh, superconducting qubit is. This is our superconducting qubit. We have a, another LC oscillator that we use to read out the state of the qubit. I'm not going to go into details of how that process works. Uh, and then we have a microwave a waveguide to excite and uh, read out the state of the qubit. So these are standard components that are used in the circuit QED community in the field where people work with uh, superconducting qubits. But what's uh, new dear, here? Dear, oh, sorry. Dear Alp, I'm sorry. Yeah. You have about five minutes. Okay, great. Okay. So what's what's new here is that we've also introduced an optical um, waveguide such that we can inject optical fields in and out of the structure as well. And the, the new part of uh, what I'm talking about is this transducer region over here that converts electrical excitations to the optical domain uh, using a combination of a piezoelectric transducer and a silicon uh, optomechanical crystal. Okay, so this is what that transducer region looks like. Um, we have the qubit uh, and we convert the qubit excitation to mechanical excitation using the piezoelectric transducer. And then we can go from mechanics to optics using this optomechanical crystal. I'm not going, I'm going to skip the details of this mechanical mode design. We cool these devices inside the dilution refrigerator such that we can operate the superconducting qubits. Um, and one of the thing, first things we do to characterize this quantum transducer is to see if our qubit is alive and operating properly. And it turns out that it was. Uh, after all these fabrication processes, we could still drive coherent dynamics of the superconducting qubit. And here we observe Rabi oscillations of the qubit. For our purposes, we're going to use this as a calibrated single microwave photon source. So our qubit uh, is going to be our single microwave photon source. And the next step in this conversion process is to convert the qubit excitation to a single phonon. Uh, so this Hamiltonian is of the James Cummings type. So this is uh, essentially a cavity QED setup, except we're doing not atom photon interactions, but we're doing qubit phonon interactions. And what we like to do is to convert the qubit excitation to a single phonon. The way we do that is we first create the pi pulse, we excite the qubit, and then we bring it onto resonance with the mechanical oscillator. We let these two systems interact for a variable amount of time. They can ex coherently exchange quantum information. And if we stop the interaction about, at about 100 nanoseconds, we can convert the qubit excitation to uh, a single phonon. That's how we can go from single qubit excitation to a single phonon. Okay, so we went from the qubit to a single phonon. The remaining step to create the optical photon is to do phonon to photon conversion. And to do that, I uh, again refer to the earlier uh, slides I described where we can make use of this three-way mixing process to upconvert a phonon 
to an optical photon at the sum frequency. So in the experiments, we apply a pump field of, of about a few microwatts in intensity and then detect single photons that uh, are upconverted from a single phonon. And we, take, we detect these single photons using a single photon detector. Okay, so this is our entire setup. Now we do the experiment under two conditions. We either excite the qubit, we either initialize the qubit in its excited state, or we don't excite the qubit, so the qubit's in its ground state. And we see that when we run these exp when we run this experiment under these two configurations, we see that we get about three times more optical photons when the qubit is in its excited state. So this the difference between this blue and the red curve shows us that we can indeed generate optical photons from a superconducting qubit. But uh, the fact that we're detecting photons even when the qubit is not excited tells us that we're adding noise in this transduction process. So based on this data, uh, the total efficiency of our transduction going from a qubit to a, the single photon detector, so this is the entire system efficiency, that's about 10 to minus 5. That's relatively low. Uh, and we, but, but we can do that uh, while adding relatively low amount of noise in the process. So the probability of detecting noise due to this transducer is about 0 0.4. Okay, so we can also measure uh, qubit dynamics using optical photon detection. So using this quantum transducer, here's a data where we measure the Rabi oscillations of a superconducting qubit using single optical photon detection uh, based on this transducer. So this is the first demonstration of an optical interface for superconducting qubits. I'm not going to go into details of uh, kind of the limitations in terms of detection efficiency. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss in the Q&A if you're interested. But what I'd like to point out is that there's a kind of a nice path for us to get to higher efficiencies and fidelities in the next uh, five-year timescale. So I think in the next five-year timescale, we expect to be able to bring these efficiencies closer to the one to 10% regime and while maintaining uh, low noise uh, throughout this process. And I think one of the exciting frontiers that's going to happen in the next you know, five to 10 years will be to use these converters to generate entanglement over between uh, remote superconducting quantum processors. So if we can create single optical photons uh, from these uh, superconducting circuits, then we can use two photon interference uh, experiments of the kind that you heard about in, in, the, in the previous talk uh, to generate entanglement, to generate measurement-based remote entanglement generation between superconducting quantum processors. Okay, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I've shown you uh, our recent results on optical photon generation from a superconducting qubit. Uh, and I think this is, uh, opens up new opportunities for generating entanglement uh, between uh, remote quantum processors. And I think the application, there's two kinds of main application areas, the way I see this. Uh, one of them is that if you want to do long distance quantum communication, it turns out you need nodes uh, that can store and process quantum information, and that can be connected uh, over long distances via optical photons. So these are called quantum repeaters. So if we have access to, now these superconducting circuits are very well developed. We are, if we could develop the, and improve the properties of these transducers, we can use superconducting technologies that are developed for realizing quantum repeaters for uh, secure quantum communication over long distances. And then secondly, these transducers could also provide a path for doing distributed quantum computing uh, over different quantum computers uh, connected uh, via some network uh, configuration. Okay, with that, I'd like to acknowledge the team. So these experiments that I talked about were done in close collaboration with Mohammed and Mahmoud uh, in Oscar Painter's group at Caltech. I acknowledge the funding agencies and then finally wanna thank you for your attention. And you can find these uh, the, the, these things that I talked about today in our recent preprint, which is now on the archive. All right, thank you. Happy to take questions then. Yeah, we thank uh, Alp Spigey very much for this nice talk. And uh, there is, I can see a question from uh, Mustafa Gündoğan. Uh, Alp, maybe you can read it uh, because this is some yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> question. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just read it. All right, thanks for the nice talk. I have a rather general question to better put your work in a context. How do you compare your work with microwave optics conversion experiments with atomic ensembles? SIV and rare earth ensembles have been proposed for similar applications. How do they compare? What are the advantages, disadvantages, uh, etc.? Is it straightforward to define efficiency for the conversion process as the atomic ensemble community does? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, let so here, here's how I view it. Um, I think for the near term, um, experiments based on um, 
you know, single atoms like SIVs or single neutral atoms um, uh, or NV centers, etc. cetera, um, they are probably uh, ahead, further ahead in terms of uh, generating entanglement over long distances, uh, preparing bell states and so on. Um, but if you look at quantum communication architectures and if you, you know, ask the hard question, okay, what do we need to realize fault tolerant quantum communication? And it turns out that you basically need to do entanglement distillation and you need to do uh, error correction at your local processors. And I think what that basically tells me is that for these uh, long distance quantum communication architectures based on quantum repeaters, you essentially need small quantum computers in the end. Um, so with systems like atoms or optical emitters, um, I think kind of the optical connection is more readily accessible, but uh, I, I think there's been, but in terms of being able to realize uh, local error corrections and so on, superconducting qubits are, uh, I think at the moment more advanced. So there's lots of nice developments with Friedberg systems. I'm putting that aside. So in that sense, the way I put uh, this work in context is that it's more about you know uh, not you know competing with uh, single atom systems in the near future, but it's more about asking the question of can we make use of advances in superconducting qubits where there's a good reason to hope that we can realize uh, error corrected small quantum computers. So that's kind of a resource. And this is exactly the kind of resource that you also need for long distance quantum communication as well, if you want to do error correction. So uh, that's where I think it has advantages compared with things like um, atomic ensembles or uh, single emitters and so on, where you don't have access to these local quantum processors just yet. There's another question. Um, uh, Mustafa, did that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'll go by the date, uh, <laughs> the time order of the questions. Okay, yeah, that will be nice. That's okay. okay, so there's a, also a question from Barish. Um, very nice talk indeed, thanks a lot. One question from a total ignorant in the experimental stuff. <laughs> Is it possible to couple more than one superconducting qubits to the photons? If it's possible, what are the limitations on the qubit number? Uh, when you say it's couple more than one qubit to the photon, do you mean... Um, let me just give the general answer. On the superconducting qubit side, you can do almost anything. Um, so you can have many superconducting qubits that you can entangle them, create various uh, entangled states. Uh, uh, but at the moment, the only thing we did is that the transducer only works with one superconducting qubit. But you can create entanglement between many superconducting qubits. For instance, you could do state transfer from one superconducting qubit to this one uh, that we're working with and then use the last one as a transducer. Um, yeah, that's, so does that answer your question, Barish? Barish, maybe you can just... Uh... Okay, I'll just move on, maybe. Okay, uh, maybe. Uh -huh. okay. Uh, and there's, uh, there's one from Alpambek. Okay. Um, actually, actually, I'm sorry. I know that there are two questions more from Mr. Japlo and Philip. Uh, okay. Gragnier, uh, just uh, there are lots of questions. <laughs> okay, okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, let's see if I can see those. Um, I I think they're on the. Oh, okay. Give me no, one no, second. They're in the chat, but first maybe it's, it's possible to uh, answer to Alpan Beck's. Okay, okay, uh, we'll do. Uh, Alpan's question is. Uh, can you think of other optomechanical resonator architectures which would have higher phonon-photon conversion efficiency? Is the conversion efficiency limited essentially due to design of suspended photonic crystal waveguide? A uh, very good question. In the end, the answer is yes. Uh, in a somewhat non-trivial way, um, I can describe why the efficiency is limited. If you're familiar with nonlinear optics, you can usually enhance the conversion efficiency by applying higher pump powers. Um, but we're here operating at very low temperatures. And uh, what we found is that, you know, if we inject more pump power into these one dimensional suspended structures, then there's some residual absorption in the system that gives rise to heating. So here's a, a data that shows the amount of heating we have as a function of the laser pulse duration. Um, and um, so we see that uh, if we extend the laser power or the duration, then we start accumulating thermal noise on the mechanics. And the 
challenge here is precisely like what you described. Because this is a suspended structure, it's very bad at dissipating heat. Uh, but there are better solutions, like two-dimensional designs uh, in this reference, where a lot of these heat dissipation problems are um, much, much better. Um, and there's a lot less noise due to these residual absorption processes. So yes, there's, um, there's designs and there's a lot to be done. Uh, and I think uh, from, from a design perspective too, I think there's lots of interesting opportunities. But he, the main limitation is operation at low temperatures and heating. Uh, that's what limits the intrinsic efficiency uh, at the moment. Okay, one another question is from Levan Subashi. Yeah. Uh, let's, okay, if after Levan Subashi, we can move to, uh, okay. Flip and uh, Özgür Müstecaplıoğlu. Okay, okay, okay. So Levan's question is, can you reach strong coupling regime in the qubit phonon part? Um, yes, I mean, we, we were in that regime kind of, not deep into strong coupling, but uh, in the strong coupling regime. And that's kind of evidenced by uh, these Rabi oscillations. So um, this was an experiment uh, where we could exchange energy between the qubit and the phonon part. And the fact that we can observe these oscillations means that you know, our G is larger than uh, the kappa and the gamma uh, in the process. Our G is two megahertz, our kappa and gamma are a, a little less than a megahertz. So. We are right uh, at the, you know, the onset of strong coupling. And this transfer fidelity from qubit to phonon was something around 70%. Okay. Let's move to uh, Philip Grass, uh, yeah. Grackner. Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce his surname. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he, uh, he says that's impressive. Can you read it? I, I can, I just, I just okay. huh? got access to it. Um, Yes, impressive work. Can you split your current quantum efficiency in different parts associated with qubit phonon and photon, et cetera? Yeah, I think I already started uh, breaking that down. I'm glad this is uh, coming up. Um, let me do that. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so our total, everything good? Yeah, yeah, everything good, sorry. Okay, okay. So our total detection efficiency is 10 minus five. Um, and there's the breakdown of this has two components. One of them is this phonon photon efficiency. And this um, has to do with the limited pump powers that we could use. This is what I discussed in terms of the heating effects. And what happens is that we have this coherent exchange rate, capital GOM. And then there's the decay rate of the optical resonator. There's the decay rate of the mechanical resonator. And the ratio of these GOM squared divided by kappa uh, optics and kappa uh, mechanics, this is called the cooperativity. And at the pump powers that we were operating at, our cooperativity was small. Uh, and we could not go to, we could not parametrically enhance this interaction uh, because of uh, heat dissipation concerns. Um, uh, so that's kind of what limits this phonon photon conversion efficiency to the 10 minus three level. That's as, this is essentially limitation of the cooperativity, which in turn is limited by the optical field intensities that we could use uh, due to heating effects. The second part, uh, this 10 to the minus two part has to do with being actually able to detect the signal. Uh, here we're trying to detect single optical photons that are generated at a five gigahertz offset. So we're applying a pump field that's a few microwatts in intensity and we scatter uh, single optical photons five gigahertz away. So, and we want to detect these using single photon counters. Um, and that's a pretty large technical challenge. So we, what we had to do was to put a series of power repair resonators in series. And in the end, we could get something like 120 dB extinction at a five gigahertz offset uh, in, a, in a regime such that we could completely cancel out the pump field and only detect the single photon component. And this 10 to the minus two part uh, of the inefficiency essentially comes from the insertion losses from three cascaded uh, Farby Perot filters. Um, yeah, so that's that's technical. And I think with good mirrors, good cavities, we can bring that to, you know, much closer to one. So we use commercial products here uh, for this first demonstration. We can move to the last question. Yeah, so uh, the last Farby question. Jablolu. Yep. Um, is there a fidelity analysis of success of state transfer from qubit to photon? Mean field approximation and noise on phonon cancellation may be limiting this. I guess this is critical for outcoupling superconducting to the outside world. Yeah. Um, so overall, the, I think the efficiencies are going to be low. So whatever we do, it's going to have to be post-selected. Uh, it's going to have to be heavily post-selected. Um, and this is similar to 
um, atom photon interface based entanglement generation processes. And in general for quantum communication protocols, there's always loss. So you all, always need to do this. And then the question comes down to, uh, okay, let's say you post select, what is the noise that you're introducing uh, in the process? So um, I think at the moment we could not um, get to high fidelities uh, due to the presence of this noise contribution in, in these first experiments. So here, when we generate a single photon, there's a noise photon probability of about 0.4%. So uh, I think um, we, we would have to make like a order of magnitude improvement in terms of these heating effects to get to high fidelity, um, uh, high fidelity single photon creation. So I guess the next milestone will be to show things like a high purity single photon generation using this uh, transducer. So if we can get um, low noise and uh, high fidelity and pure single photons, then we can go on to uh, measurement-based entanglement generation protocols. But at the moment, it's still uh, we're still not, not at the stage where we can, you know, show a G two that goes to you know below zero point one or something like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, I I would like to thank you for this nice talk. Uh, your talk, talk was uh, on time. Uh, okay. Just there were lots of questions, <laughs> but I yeah. didn't want to interrupt the questions. Uh, usually. Okay, the, uh, so this is the uh, last talk of this session and also today. And uh, I just uh, call for uh, Professor James Wutai for his uh, closing talk. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so thanks I, everyone. Uh, this was really a therapy for all of us. So I thank uh, Alp, Zeki, uh, Shahin and all of our speakers from all over the world, uh, it made us our day. Uh, so uh, our super chairman, Sevilay, asked me to remind you that at 10 tomorrow of Turkish time, we meet and continue for uh, another round of excellent talks. So thank you all for joining and you made our day for today. Thank you so much. <laughs>